Okay. <coughs> Hello, so I am uh, Jonathan uh, Frenlich, and I'm currently working at the Paris Observatory with uh, Francois Combe. So I will soon join Avishai's Deckel's team in Jerusalem. So in the previous talk, Aaron presented a model in which uh, global inflows and violent outflows were the main drivers of uh, the cusp core transformation. Here, I would like to present an alternative theoretical model we developed with uh, Amrel Zant from the British University in Egypt, in which core formation occurs uh, through a diffusion process akin to two-body relaxation, um, as in um, uh, stellar uh, dynamics. So in this model, we are trying to uh, describe from first principles how dense gas density fluctuations arising from uh, different feedback processes can affect the trajectories of dark matter particles, produce a core, and hence uh, help solve some of the challenges of uh, the lambda CDM uh, model. So I'm not going to go into the details of uh, this. So I listed some of these challenges at galactic scales. And what I'm uh, focusing here is the Corcus discrepancy, as was um, already evoked many times today, uh, which is the fact that dark matter-only simulations predict relatively universal profiles for dark matter halos that are relatively peak toward the center, while observations seem to imply a much more shallower uh, density profile. So um, in order to solve uh, this discrepancy, there are basically two kinds of approach, either solutions that fundamentally change the physics of the cosmological model. And um, James Bullock notably talked about self-interacting uh, dark matter models uh, today. And on the other hand, uh, models that would invoke bionic processes within the lambda CDM framework. So this is uh, notably, um, uh, this is uh, relatively important also be because logical, because variants play an important role precisely at the scale where these problems arise, that uh, feedback processes and outflows are extremely important in galaxies and moreover, some uh, hydrodynamical simulations with different feedback implementations were able to reproduce core uh, density profiles. But the thing is that sometimes these simulations are relatively complex and it's not always easy to, um, to say what is the specific mechanism that is at, at stake uh, for this uh, cusp core transformation. So because uh, dark matter mostly interacts gravitationally, it is through the gravitational force that a variance can affect um, dark matter particles, and that can be either due to ad adiabatic contraction, dynamical friction, or probably more importantly, repeated potential fluctuations from uh, feedback po processes. And that was notably developed by uh, Andrew Ponzen and Fabio Governato in 2012. And in these uh, two plots uh, from their uh, simulations, you can see the uh, mass fluctuations average at different radii, which means potential fluctuations, and the corresponding effect on the dark matter particles. So this is the mean uh, radial orbit of these dark matter particles as a function of time, and they slowly drift away from the center, leading to the formation of a core. So in uh, this work, they have a specific implementation of feedback that lead to these uh, mass fluctuations. And so what we wanted to do with, uh, with um, Amrel Zant was to try to have an a priori theoretical model that would enable to explain uh, core formation in this context. So what uh, we assume is that we have uh, stochastic density uh, fluctuations in the gas field in the inner part of the halo that um, <coughs> will uh, change the um, potential and then hence affect the uh, dark matter particles. So our basic assumption is that we have an imparted homogeneous gaseous medium uh, in the halo, which is obviously an, an assumption that can be discussed. We assume that we have isotropic density perturbations within the inner part of the halo. We describe these uh, fluctuations by a power-low-power spectrum 
so which is motivated by the fact that there could be a turbulent cascade from an energy driving scale, which can be the uh, outflows or the bubbles due to the feedback, different feedback uh, processes, down to uh, an, um, a dissipation scale at much lower um, scale. So we, uh, for the sake of the calculation, we assume uh, cutoff scales uh, for this power spectrum, and we assume that this process is continuous. So more, in more details, we decompose the density contrast delta in terms of its uh, Fourier component, and we consider that each uh, Fourier mode, delta of k, induces a small kick on um, the dark matter particles. So all of these small kicks cumulatively induce the dark matter particles to deviate from their original uh, orbits, and we express the uh, deviation in velocity in terms of the force autocorrelation functions that we calculated under our assumptions. And so in the diffusion limits, that is in the limit where the perturbation, the size of the perturbation is small compared to the distant tra distance traveled by the dark matter particles, we are able to uh, obtain analytically a relaxation time, which is set by the largest fluctuation scale and primarily depends on the fluctuation level and on the gas uh, fraction. So we evaluate this relaxation time in the case of a fiducial dwarf galaxy, so which corresponds roughly to the kind of galaxies where we uh, are able to observe this kind of uh, phenomena. But the thing is that the relaxation time gives us a time scale at which uh, these uh, perturbations are expected to affect the dark matter particles, but does not necessarily tell us uh, what is the global response of the system. So in order to do that, we carried out relatively simple numerical uh, simulations with the self-consistent field method developed by Hernquist and Ostriker. We put an initial uh, NFW halo we implement the perturbations as in our analytical calculations and as in our model, and we uh, evolve uh, the simulations. And so, in the first set of simulation, we follow relatively closely the assumptions of our calculations by uh, imposing spherical uh, symmetry or isotropy on the system. And what we observe is that we do observe the formation of a core within a time scale that is coherent with the relaxation time that uh, we had calculated earlier. The parameterization of uh, the core mostly depends on the fluctuation level and the gas fraction, again, as in our um, calculations with relatively weak dependence in the power law index, and uh, the fact that the um, cutoff that we assumed do not uh, affect the resulting core. So that was, as in a first step, in, uh, by assuming a spherical symmetry in our system, imposing symmetry, spherical symmetry. So if, on the contrary, we do not impose spherical symmetry, then what we observed is exactly the same effect with the same parameterization, so which um, kind of gives us confidence on the model, but everything happening at a much uh, faster time scale. And so it seems that aspherity or the non-isotropy of um, the system is a key ingredient for the efficient, uh, efficiency of cusp core transformation. And that was the object of also a paper by Andre Ponzen in 2015. And so it seems that the uh, processes that uh, redistribute the energy from the variance to the rest of the halo might be channeled in part by uh, non-isotropic processes, and which probably is different than in the model that was just uh, proposed by Aaron Dutton, in which there is uh, uh, spherical symmetry. So to conclude, in uh, our model, we have, um, we have developed this model that relies on a diffusion approximation and that describes a core formation from a stochastic uh, density perturbations. And so in the next uh, stage, we would um, uh, use hydrodynamical simulations to better characterize the statistical properties of uh, these density fluctuations. And uh, hopefully, if, uh, as we have a relatively simple parameterization of the relaxation time, we hope that this could also in turn 
uh, help better understand the effects of different feedback implementations on the cusp core um, transformation. So, as I already mentioned, there are different descriptions of uh, this process, uh, notably that with, uh, from, by Aaron Dutton and Avishai Dekel, uh, which it would be interesting to compare both approaches. And there is another approach uh, that is uh, currently being submitted by Jean-Baptiste Fouri and Rebecca Boyeri that also try to uh, describe this process as a diffusion uh, process. Finally, there could be some generalization of our calculation. And I think that to finish with the fact that um, non, um, that isotropy is a very important uh, aspect of the cup score transformation that needs to be uh, studied in more detail. Lambda? To lambda min, the smallest scale where you, you truncate things. Yes, so it's actually highly, uh, it doesn't depend that much on lambda min. So there is a dependence in lambda max, but the thing is that the depletion time depends only on lambda max. So it's as, as if basically the large scales are uh, sweeping the smaller scales, and that the smaller scales are disappearing in the uh, effect of the uh, larger scales. And the thing is that although the relaxation time depends on lambda max, the effect on the core is independent of lambda max. And that we can um, quite, we can understand it in terms of uh, diffusion limit in the sense that the time scales, um, so basically we assume a number, uh, a different number of kicks and the force uh, for each kick will depend on lambda max, but basically um, there are different things that compensate each other and that makes that the effect on the core in the end doesn't depend on, on the max. Uh, so if you injected all of the energy, let's say in a ring rather than at the center or something like that, would you get a very different result, you think? I mean, maybe that's a related, I mean, it's not the same question, but it's potentially related here in terms of where the energy is injected. So, I mean, we haven't done such uh, simulations. Um, here we basically assume that the energy in, is injected in a small uh, sphere right. at the center. And um, it might be interesting. I mean, I think yeah. the self-consistent okay. field code should give you the yeah. possibility to look at where, yeah. you know, whether this depends strongly on where the energy is injected, which okay. could be useful. It should be easy to yeah. implement. Actually. Okay. Any last questions for Jonathan here? If not, let's thank him again for a nice talk. Flows, where the main drivers of uh, the cusp core transformation. Here, I would like to present an alternative theoretical model we developed with uh, Amrel Zant from the British University in Egypt, in which core formation occurs uh, through a diffusion process akin to two body relaxation, um, as in uh, relatively peak toward the center, while observations seem to imply a much more shallower uh, density profile. So, um, in order to solve uh, this discrepancy, there are basically two kinds of approach, either solutions that fundamentally change the physics of the cosmological model, and um, James Bullock notably talked about self Hello, so I am uh, Jonathan uh, Frenlich, and I'm currently working at the Paris Observatory with uh, Francois Combe. So I will soon join Avishai Dekel's team in Jerusalem. So in the previous talk, Aaron presented a model in which uh, global inflows and violent out um, uh, stellar uh, dynamics. So in this model, we're trying to uh, describe from first principles how Dense gas density fluctuations arising from uh, different feedback processes can affect the trajectories of dark matter particles, produce a core, and hence uh, help solve some of the challenges of uh, the lambda CDM uh, model. So I'm not going to go into the details of uh, this. So I listed some of these challenges at galactic scales, 
And what I'm uh, focusing here is the Quarkus discrepancy, as was um, already evoked many times today, uh, which is the fact that dark matter only simulations predicts relatively universal profiles for dark matter halos that are 